I actually want to start by thanking Beacon because actually they were um, the ones that helped conceptualize meeting last year and this year and uh, again next year. So these summits are really um, because of that partnership and leadership. So I appreciate that. So um, one of the opportunities we have to talk about today is just some data about the workforce in general, and then also talk a little bit about some things that behavioral health that tie back to the data um, to begin the conversation with um, this panel today on emerging in um, trends and strategies. So. There we go. Um, I serve at the pleasure of Governor Ricketts and uh, the DHHS CEO, Courtney Phillips. And this slide I always share just in the context of um, it's not just about government, it's also about health care. And so when we set priorities in the state for efficiency and effectiveness um, of what's provided by the government and um, the work to really make it customer friendly, when we're talking about health care, this means that we're working really, really hard to make sure that individuals have timely access to service, that they're able to have um, not only um, evidence-based, but very efficient, effective services that make a difference in, and move people towards recovery. And we want to do it in a very user-friendly way. Obviously, the growth part is why we're here. We've got to have workforce to take care of all of the health care needs that we have. This slide, um, which comes to us from the Department of Labor, is really looking at long-term um, occupation projections. So in the blue is uh, growth openings, which means, and again, you can look at total um, nursing um, occupations, registered nurses, nurse anesthetists, nurse midwives, practitioners, and licensed um, vocation or practical nurses. So the blue is really talking about as healthcare grows, as our population ages, what's the new number of nurses that we're gonna be needing? And the replacement, which is in pink, is looking at as people retire and age out, people go on vacation, they change um, uh, careers. And if you look at um, the graph, under registered nurses, which is the second column, that means that we're gonna need 13.5% more nurses than what we currently have in the state of Nebraska. And you can see it for each of the other professions. So we've got some work to do just, again, um, this is nursing in general, not specifically for um, psychiatric nursing. In this next slide, then, it takes that data and breaks it out so it looks at it statewide and also by our um, more common urban areas and in our rural um, areas. So you can see statewide, we still have a lot of work, but then look for your own particular area in Omaha, in Lincoln, in Grand Island. Look how high those graphs are for what our needs are gonna be. And then move it on out to um, the rural areas. We are not gonna have enough workforce. So that is really gonna um, get us to think about the opportunity to fill those gaps. Um, and what does that mean for telehealth? And how do we maximize um, existing workforce if we can't grow as much as fast as um, the need arises? One of the opportunities that we're taking in the Division of Behavioral Health to really um, grow and uh, provide capacity and knowledge to existing providers on the substance use side is we're gonna be using, in partnership with UNMC Beacon, um, Project ECHO, which is the extension for um, community health care outcomes. And what that is, is it will provide an opportunity for training didactically people's knowledge about substance use, but then also have case consultations. So if you're a primary care um, provider in O'Neill, Nebraska, and you have a person in your care that needs substance use care, um, how can we grow that person's um, knowledge? What about that in nursing? What does that look like? Look at this gap that we have in urban and rural. What are some of those great opportunities we have to um, expand the knowledge base of our existing workforce? I shared this one, which is the top 15 industries employing nurses, because guess what? This is our competition. So what can we learn from these other industries and places of work in terms of their best practices for recruitment and retention? And um, what are their projections um, that they um, need to really grow nurses? 
Um, most of us that uh, have worked in business at some point, whether it's a hospital or a clinic, and somebody mentioned this morning that one of the graduate or undergraduate important things is just knowing the business, right? So here's an opportunity for us. We got to know our competition. We got to know best practices. And I always think it's okay to steal and borrow thoughts, right? Why reinvent the wheel? Um, so again, an opportunity to think about different categories of conversations. Top three industries employing nurses, and again, this is nurses overall. Um, I wanted to highlight just the yellow pieces of the pie, and that's under nurse anesthetists and nurse midwives, so that's education, okay? So in those particular fields, those are um, top three industries for those kinds of nurses. Is there a lot of yellow in our registered nurses, nurse practitioners, licensed practical, and vocational nurses? So does that maybe tell us we need to take a step back if we want to grow our workforce and we want to train and educate um, and change practice, we have to have people that are gonna do that and teach. And so we're trying to put incentives in place for um, the actual clinical practice and I like that. And yet if we have even one person on a wait list to come into nursing, when we know there's a gap, we're gonna to have to figure out something to incentivize individuals going into education. And what does that look like? And sometimes we may have to think about, our goal certainly is to have baccalaureate nurses, but we have a lot of gap. And so what are those opportunities to think about, is it okay if we have an associate degree nurse? I know at our state hospitals, we pay for the ANCC um, accreditation. So there's great opportunity to also continue to grow. Tuition assistance programs, those kinds of things. So let's also think creatively about how do we get the number of students, because four years is a long time. Um, it's great, it's great clinical, it's great practice, it's great preparation, but when we have this gap, we might need to think about um, things a little bit more creatively. Um, on this is really looking at degrees. So, associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree. If you look at the blue, kind of the darker blue um, pieces of the pie there, um, that's where we could consider psychiatric nursing. But again, it's not specific in the way that um, Department of Labor um, collects that. Now, they have gotten a lot of feedback from me um, as they've helped me with these slides um, about the opportunity to really get more specific. So they will be collecting and doing some surveys again in 2018. So hopefully we'll have some more specific um, data. Now, the good news is, is that we have 87.9%, and this is from the Nebraska Center for Nursing Practice in 2016, that if you're a nurse, that 87.9% of the nursing field said they would encourage others to go into nursing. That's pretty darn good. Now, do we know how we encourage others to go into nursing? What are those strategies that really work? We heard a lot of strategies today. And are we measuring those things to know which really is the most impactful and is going to get us where we need to go? And then choosing nursing. 85.4% of nurses say they would choose it. And they would choose it again. I think that is a phenomenal um, number and shows a lot of strengths. Um, with nursing, but again, we've got to be able to capitalize on specific strategies that'll get us where we need to go. Skip over that one. So employment satisfaction for registered nurses. So the top part is what RNs like most. So people for whom I provide services, the patients, work itself, and people with whom I work, coworkers. Those are the very top. So what does that tell us, again, about drawing in strategies, about graduation um, from high school and in trying to entice um, nurses? Are we demonstrating that they can make a good career? And you know, when they have to invest what they do in tuition, can they see the long-term um, strategies of the living that they can make because of the job security as a nurse? 
And then the bottom's looking at what RNs like the least. So what's our takeaway there? Almost a third said there isn't anything I don't like. I would love to talk to those nurses and get their ideas <laughs> and their positivity. That's fabulous. And then looking second is salary. And we've talked about um, salary. But hours and schedule is third. And we know work-life balance from we're behavioral health, right? Taking care of ourselves, taking care of our talent, and work-life balance is critical. And so if that's what they like least, we need to spend some time on investing strategies to address that and being as flexible as we can. This is looking at the age spread. Um, and this was a point in time survey in 2016, and again from the Nebraska Center for Nursing. So on the left-hand side, it starts at 21 years old, and believe it or not, it goes all the way up to age 90. So, and if you go from 80 to 90, there's still a tiny bit of yellow. There are some amazing nurses out there. Amazing nurses. So, they like nursing, they're staying in it, so I want to talk to that 90-year-old, right? The other thing is, if you look at between the blue lines, um, uh, like between the Generation X and then where the baby boomers are, you're looking to make sure that those lines are proportional. Because that means that as the nurses age, that you're going to continue to be able to fill that gap. But if you start looking at age 30, which is that blue line to the left, and yay 30-year-olds, 30 30 right? That's another group I would love to talk to on here. Because you look at the, the decline on nurses that are coming in, and by that age, we have a little bit of work to do, especially with the younger individuals. So that is also an opportunity, those of you that are researchers and surveyors, for us to really think about that. But look at the difference between age 30 and age 40. That's a, you know, if you look at a trend line, that's, that's a decline. And so again, we're going to have challenges filling gaps if we don't start really looking at what are these positive trends um, that we need to take care of. The other thing is, is I bet if you're 90 years old, somehow you were able to figure out how to take care of yourself wherever you worked, and that you had work-life balance and could love and go to work and love what you do. And we got to have some of those strategies. RNs per 1,000 um, persons by county in Nebraska. This is, again, Nebraska Center for Nursing. So the lighter the color, the fewer the nurses. The darker the color, the more, um, the more nurses we have. And so again, if you look at that, there's no national standard. There's not a Nebraska standard. But we can see where there's not nurses, right? And then to try and be data-driven, so where do we concentrate our recruitment and retention strategies as a whole? Remember, this isn't psych nurses. This is nurses in general. But if you think about the opportunity to look at prevalence of mental health and substance use disorder, the number of particular behavioral health providers also in those counties, um, could be poverty level, um, could be age, could be a lot of factors to overlay with this to really help us zone in and target. Do we need to start focusing on those rural areas, on the urban areas? Are there particular counties that will really help us, again, begin to, to grow our own um, workforce? And what partnerships are out there? You can see that there, there's touch on even the counties that don't have any nurses. There's touch on places that do have nurses. And what does that look like, again, in mental health and psychiatric nursing to be able to grow and partner um, across our state? So one of the opportunities I think we have, and this panel will be talking about, is responding to the data. So I'm going to challenge us a little bit. And those of you that work at the regional center know I do that, right? Yes. And the other thing that I say is when we're behavioral health, we have to have the hard conversations. We have to be role models of that. We have to be able to talk to each other. So I always say what we permit, we promote. So what we permit, we promote. So when we talk about having specialty psychiatric nursing, and we need that. 
We have individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, co-occurring disorders, um, uh, folks that come to us um, under court order and mental health board commitments, um, individuals that um, have tried to take their life. We need specialty nursing and we need particular experts. But when we're talking about behavioral health, we are talking about the voices of not these people, not this group of persons. These are the voices of people with mental illness and substance use disorder. These are chronic illnesses, chronic relapsing, which means we're not gonna fix them one and done, which is what many people, and that's why we have stigma, um, many people believe. These are the voices of people that are our neighbors and our family members, and if you look around this room, people in this room. And so unless and until we identify those short-term and long-term strategies to get us where we need to go, we are always going to be, hello, psych. We would never do that to a person that comes in and is on a medical unit. There would not be a nurse that's going to say, I don't do diabetes. I don't know how to talk to them. I don't know what to say. If I tell them, they might not take their insulin. We would never do that. And our nation and our job as ambassadors of change is to normalize that healthcare conversation. Because we will only be able to fill that gap if every nurse can talk to those patients, can screen and assess. And we do that. You guys have great integration, and I'm, Joe's going to be talking about all the integration um, opportunities that we have. But we can't rely on specialty nurses, which many of you are, to take care of this state. There's, there's no way. So I am going to say that if we help our colleagues and our partners in the community think differently, have those conversations about what we're permitting and identify what we want to promote, we will be able to flip the continuum. One of the things we've been talking about at the regional centers to have students, um, because many of them don't have psychiatric rotations, is that's fine. How about we approach it from a physical health? Why don't we have a clinic at the regional centers that's really all about physical health? And by golly, we might have some students that were able to come and do their assessment skills, diabetes, teaching, all different kinds of things, but they're doing it to a population that happens to have mental illness and substance use disorder. So what does that look like? How do I use those partnerships that we have with students um, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Norfolk, um, for example? But beginning to think differently and really pushing that. Um, this morning they were talking about labor and delivery and how, uh, I can't remember the examples about all the, I think it was with the DEU model, how many of them, like eight out of ten of them wanted to go into labor and delivery, right? Okay, so if you're on labor and delivery, are we talking about what medications, if a person has mental illness, are okay for a pregnant woman? What about substance use? Did you know that methadone is a medication that people can take, women can take while they're pregnant? What about the NICU and babies that are born with withdrawal syndrome? There's great conversations, right, to continue to grow that capacity. Mental health first aid and QPR people talked about this morning, we gotta have everybody, and not just in healthcare, not just in healthcare, because how many CPR classes are in communities? Extension offices, you know, American Heart, community colleges, everybody has it. What about mental health first aid? Dr. Stewart talked about that. QPR, question, persuade, refer for suicide. Those are things that we can do to help our own neighbors. So I wanted to end on a success story, and it's not done. But I do want to talk, because our nurses work hard, and I said this last year, and many of them are here today. 
Um, the people that we serve in the state hospital system are very ill. It's, we are like intensive, these nurses are intensive care nurses. Only happens to be in a psychiatric hospital. Two years ago, when I was appointed by the governor in August of 2015, we had a 48% vacancy rate at Lincoln Regional Center. 245 bed. How can you do care? How can you do care? And they had some good ideas there. Um, the ANCC certification was a great idea. And by golly, if people got certified, how about you up their pay? It was a great concept, but it wasn't going anywhere. And so we had lots of conversations, lots of good ideas by people in this room. And we said, what if we flip that? And we say that in the state system, because we have to compete with other state systems. A nurse is a nurse is a nurse. But that wasn't the case that we wanted to make. So we said, these nurses take care of diabetes. They take care of heart attacks. They take care of broken legs. They do all this other stuff. And they're a behavioral health nurse. And so we worked really hard with our state personnel. And they came in and they actually did observation of our nurses. And it didn't take them very long. I don't know if any of you were there that day. But it didn't take them very long to realize that in the state system, these nurses were very different. And so we were able to, and this is another thing, and come back to what Senator Vargas was saying. With no new money, we said, we want to recruit and retain our nurses. So we want to bump and pay for this behavioral health registered nurse classification to be able to raise the bar. And we want to take care of our talent. So we want to have an incentive for persons, uh, nurses that are here from one to 10 years. And we'll give them a bump helps with wage compression. No new dollars. How do you do that? You do that because you want to pay your own nurses. I don't want to pay agency nurses that cost three times as much as our nurses. I don't want to have the overtime. And we're not perfect. I'll get to the graph here in one moment. But we're not perfect. But if we decreased overtime in agency nurses, we could pay. So it was a return on investment. You saw it started to come down. And very, the lowest is on the orange line, the 14.7. And then Dr. Stewart came along last year at the nursing summit and talked about task shifting. So we said, who needs to do what? And do we have the right mix of nurses? What about some LPNs and RNs? And what about supervisors? So we were able to get it down to 14.7. Now it's come back up. But we're opening a fifth unit, so we're opening, <laughs> so we need more nurses now. And we've also had some nurses that were promoted into positions, and so we have to backfill. So I'm not alarmed yet at um, our percentage, but I just wanted to give that example of there is so much creativity in this room. I know Senator Vargas, you have his ear, you have your senator's ear, but the opportunity you have is endless to be creative and make your business case, because there's a lot a lot of things that can happen that way. And I'm very excited to see what the panel has to say on other trends and strategies.